that we were in fire fights almost constantly. He fired and killed a guy in the foxhole right next to me. I hate to say this, but I know I caused some Japanese deaths. I don't know how many. And I told her the truth that he got shot in the head. Didn't know what hit him. That was the only night I gave up absolutely hope of coming home. Warning, the frontline testimony you're about to hear is, at times, extremely graphic. The realities of war are often difficult, but it's vitally important that these stories are told and the lessons are learned. Your discretion is advised. My name is Carl Bernard Berghofer. This is the Marine Corps, just before my 18th birthday. I guess my mother's advice, she didn't want me to go into service. But uh, I enlisted the Marine Corps, and uh, I wasn't called up until after my 18th birthday, and I had boot camp training in Paris Island, South Carolina. And man, it was a rude awakening out there. It was just a sand pit out in the swamps. I got training in firearms. Then I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina for advanced training. And then about the 1st of October that year, we got on a troop train for overseas. And we shipped over first to Pearl Harbor. And uh, then we went from there to the Marshall Islands. We had uh, Thanksgiving dinner at the Marshall Islands aboard ship. And then went on up to Guam. And I got into Guam. Uh, and the campaign for Guam was over with. We were assigned to the 3rd Marine Division as replacements. And we went ashore on Guam and set up a tent city. And then we had a lot of patrols, combat patrols. There were still a lot of Japanese remnants on the island. And they were, would slip down every once in a while and shoot mortar shells into our camp area and, and into their base. And, and so we were constantly going out on patrols so trying to eliminate the remaining troops. So we got quite a bit of combat experience on Guam. Guam is a beautiful island, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, the Japanese would hold up in the central mountains on the east side, a real rugged country, and they'd hold up in caves. And the last Japanese surrendered about 20 years later. We trained on Guam and got some combat experience. And then they uh, assigned a convoy to go up to Evo. We didn't know we were going to Evo until we were almost there. They announced it over the speaker system. We were going to Iwo Jima. And the 3rd Division was supposed to be a reserve division on Evo. The 4th and 5th were supposed to assault the island and take the island, 4th and 5th divisions, and the 3rd was in was reserve. Sure enough, they needed the second day of the campaign. So we moved the 3rd division into the second day of the campaign, and uh, I was in the a replacement battalion, and we followed the 3rd division in. And then the third division went into contact uh, into combat up the center of the island, and the fifth division was on our left, and the fourth division was on our right, and we were assigned to go up the center of the island, and uh, they immediately needed a replacement, so I went in the next day at the end of the lines as a replacement, and I went in. They had just captured the first airstrip. And I was on the island when the flag went up. All the boat whistles went off, and we looked up and saw the little first little flag was, was up on uh, Mount Sarabachi. And uh, we knew we'd be able to take the island. But we suffered a lot of casualties, and the, the beach uh, when we went ashore was littered with wrecked LSTs and wrecked Higgins boats, and we had to go ashore aboard a, a beached uh, LST. We were under shell fire all the time. My first assignment when we went ashore, we were went ashore and set down a gear in, 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 in Japanese foxholes, 
And then we went down and sort of unloaded the LSTs uh, and setting up the 12th Artillery, which was the Marine Corps, the 3rd Division's uh, artillery unit. And we were carrying ammunition up and sandbagged it into the units. And we stayed there the first night of the next day we were call, almost called up to the lines as a replacement. We were already suffering heavy casualties on the 3rd Division. I got on the lines on time to make the assault on the 2nd Airstrip. The 1st Airstrip was, and 2nd Airstrip were completed. The 1st Airstrip was completely graveled and the 2nd Airstrip was mostly graveled. And uh, the 3rd Division, we had the 4th and 5th coming up the flanks, and the 3rd Division made an assault across the 2nd Airstrip. That was my first taste of actual combat. And it was a bloody mess. The Japanese were dug out on the north side and all the cliffs and, and had pillboxes and everything lined up. Never dug in. They used to go from one end of that island from the other underground four or five times and never stick your head above ground. We assaulted the second airstrip and went across it. And I remember looking back and there was dead and wounded Marines all across the airstrip. They had the artillery and machine guns all set up to protect it. We had to make two assaults before we finally took the Second airstrip. And uh, of course, our artillery units and the naval units and the Air Force were bombarding the Japanese positions just ahead of us to give us covering fire, so we had pretty good cover fire. But the Japanese, so uh, when they were We'd go make an advance of maybe 50 feet or 50 yards in a day, and we'd blow up all the holes and the foxholes and the caves and everything we could find, uh, blow those up, and the next night you'd be sitting in a foxhole, and you could feel vibrations where they we were digging out the tunnels underneath that you had caved up, and the next day there'd be Japanese behind you as well as that in front of you. They were really a resourceful and dedicated troops. I mean, can you describe when you were running across in the open and there's these bullets going off around you, what, what is that like? Uh, I'll tell you, it, it induces you to run. Bend down low to the ground and make your feet move. It was scary, but we knew the only safety was to get, get out of it. So we went across. Uh, we went across it. it. Took us probably five minutes, or maybe six minutes, to get across the strip. Totally in the open. Huh? It was totally in the open. Totally in the open. What do you remember about the casualties that you saw? Uh we got got the trenches. The tr first bounds of trenches. Look back. I looked back across the airstrip and he was speckled with dead and dying Marines all over it. I don't know how many of killed, was quite a lot, or wounded. Most of them were wounded and were evacuated later. When you were actually running across, do you recall men going down? When, uh, you, when you were actually running across the airstrip, do you remember men actually going down around you? I don't remember it. I remember Ben going down. I remember looking back. And can you tell us about how were the Japanese posi positioned in the trench? They were positioned. They had uh, the trenches were zigzag trenches, and every zag out they had a a uh, machine gun or some machine gun, and. Uh, and they had rifles scattered in between the machine guns. And they all carried lots of grenades. And so you guys got to the edge and you just start open firing? or Huh? So you get to the edge of the trench and you just open up? or Yeah. 
that since there were about uh, three feet wide and about three feet deep, most of them. And they were, I, a lot of the trenches were walled up with sticks or rock on both sides. They were actually like a little ditch. The Japanese had had years to fortify all that. And they had some permanent trenches in there. And then the tunnels and caves were on the cliff behind it. The cliff behind the second airship was about 10 or 12 feet high. What can you tell us about the pillboxes? Do you remember seeing, you know, any of the pillboxes? Oh, that... yes. We saw a lot of pillboxes. Most effective against pillboxes were the flamethrowers and shape charges. And I played several shape charges. I used a lot of Bangalore torpedoes. You could take a Bangalore torpedo and jab it in one of those holes and, and ignite it. They were made. They were made for cutting up barbed bar wire fencing and trenchments. But they were really effective in in caves and foxholes, uh, caves and uh, entrenchments. How would pillbox. you guys, How would you guys get close enough to the pillboxes to actually do that? Well, we'd get cover fire on them. And the Japanese had their pillbox all interlocking. They had designed that, the general had designed that, had every pillbox that was there could be hit by two other pillboxes on either side, by machine gun or right small cannon fire. And they were interlocking, and the way we'd do it would we'd, we'd, uh, fire all the, the pillboxes closes, interlocking, Give them cover fire, then a man would run in and drop a safe charge or a Bangalore torpedo or something on the, either put a safe charge on the outside of the pillbox or a Bangalore torpedo or a flamethrower inside. And then we'd take cover in that pillbox uh, while they were assaulting an extra to us. And you actually remember doing the shape charges yourself? Uh, I was, I was, I fired a couple of shape charges. Most of mine was Bangalore torpedo. I liked it. It was a long pipe, and you could stick them together, jam them down the hole, and then pull the bats and back off a ways. And man, they would make a hell of a blast. They didn't put up much shrapnel, but they they sure brought down the rock walls. I'll never forget the three smells that I never forgot. The smell of dead bodies, decaying bodies, the smell of blood, and the smell of sulfur. The whole island was as near as a, my idea of hell on earth that I can imagine. I remember our first night assault uh, through the, to the north shore and uh, there was about 15 men were called at random, and uh, we were lined up and muffled all of our gear so it wouldn't make any sound, and uh, we went down uh, uh, kind of a steep ravine very, very quietly, went through the Japanese lines, and went down and climbed down a cliff and onto the uh, shelf or it was a drop off of the North Beach, and it was uh, the shelf was sandy. All of it was able was sandy. Uh, we went down and to the cliffs overlooking the North Beach, and uh, set up uh, right along the edge of the cliffs to uh, intercept any Japanese runners going through, and. Uh, about, uh, we'd been there a couple of hours, and we dig foxholes on Iwo Jima. When you dug a foxhole in the sand, it was about three feet deep and about eight feet wide because the sand would run in, the pumice would run in. And when you were walking in the sandy area, especially climbing a terrace, you take one step up and you slide back a half. 
and you had to go up those terraces and things on your hands and knees. The only way to climb up that loose sand. And uh, that night we dug in on the edge of the cliffs overlooking the North Beach, and the Japanese covered us up. That was the only night I gave up absolutely hope of coming home. I'd already promised my mama that I would never be taken alive by the Japanese. I had a first cousin that was captured on Bataan, went through the Japanese uh, death march on Japan, and he was taken to Japan and used in forest labor as the operations up there, the military uh, construction work. And uh, he died of dysentery and malnutrition. And uh, we got word from the Japanese he died and, and uh, really broke man up. And I, oh, I promised my mama that I would never be taken alive by the Japanese. And what is that like, sir, to be 18 and to feel like you're going to die? Well, actually, uh, I wouldn't say it was a relief, but it was a determination. I uh, didn't, didn't look forward to it, but I really didn't think about it that much. It was in the back of my mind, but I really didn't think about it all that much. After all, uh, I've learned uh, all, all my life that life is cyclic. You live, you're born, you live, you die, and hope for a hereafter. And uh, I've had animals that lived and died and born and lived and died and everything is like that. That's just a way of life. Even the planets and the stars are that way. And that night we were on the northern beach, the Japanese covered us up and they were throwing grenades right at us, little Japanese grenades. And the thing that saved us was the sand, the grenades would land on the sand and they'd go in about six inches. Instead of blowing sideways, they'd blow straight up. But that night we, we fought off the Japanese. We had uh, two bar gunners and the rest of us riflemen. And we held the Japanese off from assaulting us and overrunning us. And uh, the next morning, uh, right at dawn, uh, of course, they had star shells going over all night. And the Japanese couldn't advance when the star shells were up. And the next morning at daylight, the Japanese pulled back, and I looked up on the cliffs on the above us about 200 yards, and there was helmets up there. And we thought they were Japanese, so we focused in the rifles on them, and, and somebody said, those are Marines. And it was the Marines that had some advance to the top of the ridge to give us covering fire. They'd heard the shooting going on all night. And they advanced to the top, top of the ridge. So we evacuated our position and went, got back. And uh, that night there was, I think, three of our 15 were killed. Most of them shot at point blank range. And... Uh, Three or four of us wounded. I wasn't hurt at all. But it was a lifesaver seeing those rain helmets going up on the cliff above us there. And then we went back on duty and uh, several days of fighting. And then the, the day I got wounded, which was March 15th, just uh, I think it was two days before the Islanders battle was officially declared over with, I, uh, we were in a group of, uh, they combined L and I company together, and uh, there was, uh, of, of, of the two full companies that went ashore on Iwo Jima, there was 11 of the original men still active, and then they had some replacements that were still active. So L and I company was 
had gotten below a functional unit, so they combined the whole two companies together, and we had less than a platoon of men. And we were assigned to make an assault north across the big flat. The last remnants of the Japanese were holed up on a on a point up by Katano Point. That was the last stand. It was the north. It was a little point stuck out in the ocean on the north side of the island, rocky, uh, lots of cliffs and rim rocks, and and uh, they were holed up there. And we were ordered to make an assault to eliminate the last, and we made an assault across a opening about fifty yards wide, and a clearing. And in the cliffs were the hills and the cliffs were on the opposite. And we went across without any trouble at all. And we were sort up a little rise and I got up on that rise and I stuck my head and shoulders over and it looked like a mushroom patch ahead of us. And the uh, little swale that was ahead of us there uh, with Japanese helmets. All of them had a rifle poker at it. So I lifted my feet up it took me five minutes to drop down to the ground, <laughs> and I tumbled back and man, they just shot a, a swath of bullets right across where I'd been. And the only way we could attack them, we'd raise the rifles above our head and point them at General Japanese and pull the triggers and empty the rifles and reload. And, and I remember one of our guys got a, the gas cylinder blown off his rifle by a Japanese rifle bullet. And uh, we were within probably 25 yards of the Japanese uh, line. And uh, so we threw all the grenades we had and and, uh, and we couldn't get resupplied. So the order came down for us to withdraw. And uh, so there was a big rock out there about 50 yards from us on uh, the rear and so uh, our platoon leader said make a run for that rock and let's get out of here. So we run about three or four of us at a time and run zigzag and get behind the rock and the first three or four went through without a shot fired at them. And then the next three or four that went through the power was all around them, and my turn came up, and uh, man, I took off as fast as I could, and I made it to about two jumps before the, uh, that big rock, and I got hit. I didn't know I was hit. Uh, I came to on the ground, and uh, I felt blood on the back all over the face, and, and uh, I came to and I thought I had fallen, stumbled and fallen down and hit my head on a rock and broke my nose. And then the uh, French of LaSalle was our platoon leader. He was a uh, Cajun from New York, from New Iberia, Louisiana. And he was a senior PFC. And he was a company commander. And, uh, he hollered up behind the rock and said, Bring your armor, I see you moving, are you okay? And I don't remember what I asked him. He says, if you can get two jumps, I can grab you and pull you behind this rock. So I remember just saying something like, let me get oriented. And so I took a couple of breaths and got reoriented, and got to my feet and ran over, made about two jumps, he jugged me behind that rock. And I had a rifle sawed in the back of my head. It had gone through my helmet from uh, left to right and blew a little 25 hole going in, it was Jap 25, and blew a big hole where it came out on the helmet. And the doctor said, you, it's a good thing you had a German hard head. <laughs> It was hard enough to deflect that bullet uh, at the aid station when I went back. And I was evacuated then. I managed to walk back with the assistance 
the aid stations. I didn't want to go on a stretcher because we had, stretcher duty was one of the worst duties we had. When we were on the lines, we'd p pick up wounded and dead, carry them back to the beach. That was before they had a field hospital set up on Evo itself. And we'd carry them back to the beach, and we were under fire all the time. We'd have two men to a stretcher. We'd carry one man out running from cover to cover, and we'd carry him back down to the beach and uh, turn him over to the medical people. And then we'd pick up, uh, go by the LSCs and pick up water and ammunition and grenades, and load them on a stretcher and carry them back to the lines. And we had stretcher duty. I had stretcher duty almost every day and sometimes twice a day. And that was a duty I hated because uh, we had a lot of stretcher bearers were hit, hurt, because got wounded. And uh, so I evacuated back myself back to the field hospital and uh, I was treated by a doctor and he asked me where I was from and I told him, and he says he was from Santa Fe, and Dr. Raymond, and he was a, uh, and got called up the military, and he was from Santa Fe. And I met him uh, after the war was over. We got together and had dinner together several times. He had uh, some of the survivors of Iwo Jima would get together about once a month and have dinner together. So I was evacuated back to Guam, and I was put in the hospital. And uh, I was there for about two weeks. Then I went back to duty on Guam, and we were went back to duty putting up or reestablishing our camp area on Guam for the third region, uh, original base. Let's get into the meat of combat. You know, because that's that's what that's why I'm here is to talk to you about the reality of war. Could you tell us about your experiences? on Iwo Jima uh, uh, firing at the enemy. What do you remember about the firefights you got into? Well, we, uh, we were at firefights almost constantly, uh, five or six times a day. And the Japanese were a tremendous soldier. If I was a general and wanting to establish a real military force, I would make it with German officers British NCOs and Japanese foot soldiers. Thank you for sharing that. Can you tell us about some specific memories you have uh, about firing at the, the Japanese? Yeah, uh, that night on the northern part of the beach is the one I remember most specifically because the Japanese were only about 30 or 40 feet away from us. And uh, we would have a grenade come over and we'd shoot at the arms when the star shell would come up. We'd see the arms come up. And then uh, a Japanese soldier uh, charged, uh, charged a position and uh, he got behind a, a rock and the guy next to me in the foxhole, uh, we focused in on that rock when the star shells went off. and. The minute the next star shell came on, I had uh, focused my rifle on the left-hand side of the rock, and he stuck his head out on the right-hand side. So at the time I had to shift my rifle, he fired and killed a guy in the foxhole right next to me. A guy by the name of Binder from New York City. He got shot right in the head. And... Uh, so I had some fire and I, 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 I wounded the Japanese soldier, but not critically. I hit him in the side of the head and I could hear him laying there moaning all night long until the next morning. And the next morning one of our people finished him off with a bar gun. One day there was a, we were up on top of a ridge and we looked over about, about 300 yards and we saw people running from one from behind a hole on one side of the cliff to a, a pit, a foxhole on the other side. And we, I saw three or four run through there. And 
uh, they were so far off, I couldn't make sure whether they were Japanese or platoon leader said those are Japanese soldiers. So I uh, was a pretty good shot, so I asked, I said, I better try for them. So I, I shot three or four times. I lead them and got them down pat, and I know I hit two of them. Uh, it was uh, one time I remember definitely I wounded. So many of the Japanese soldiers we faced that were wounded, we uh, knew they were wounded, but there were so many guys firing, we didn't know actually who hit who. And uh, so there was a lot of confusion on that. I hate to say this, but I know I caused some Japanese deaths. I don't know how many. We didn't have any qualms about it. As I said, we didn't take any prisoners, and we didn't want to be taken prisoner. And uh, that's the reason I went in the Marine Corps, because of the, I had a brother-in-law that was in the Marine Corps during the Nicaraguan campaigns. And he said, if you want good training, go in the Marine Corps. If you want good food, go in the Air Force. If you want an easy life with a, a warm bed every night, go in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> One day uh, we took a pocket and we dug in for the day and uh, uh, took over a bunch of Japanese foxholes. And the way we do that, uh, we, we get in and we shoot some Japanese on a foxhole or artillery or get them or something. We pull them out of the foxhole and drag, drag them one side and take over their foxholes. Uh, and uh, they had real, uh, they had reinforced foxholes all over that island. And that day we broke out our sea rations and sat down in front of the dead, bloated bodies. One side sat down and ate our sea rations right there. Uh, you get toughened up with things like that. I would, on stretcher bearer duty, I'd see the Japanese soldiers dead, and we'd carry our wounded down, and, and we'd have, uh, lay them out, and if they were dead, we'd lay them out with the burial area, lay them out, and then go back to duty again. I was saying about uh, one day when I was on stretcher booty, and we took a wounded uh, Marine down to the beach and turned him over to the medics to take back to the hospital ship. And we went up to this LSD and we wanted to get, uh, officer came off, said, what do you need? And we said, we needed a case of grenades, five gallons of water, and uh, a, a case of 30 caliber ammunition on a stretcher. And he came in and he had an enlisted man. He says, get that stuff for these guys. And he invited us up into the ship. And how long has it been since you had a square meal? And we told him it been days. So they took us into the officer's mess and served us steaks and potatoes and everything in the officer's mess. And then they had the, one of the people go get us a fresh set of dungarees our dungarees were all rotted on our bodies. And so we had a salt water shower and a clean set of dungarees and a good meal. And I remember commenting to him, I said, I didn't know the Navy lived this good. He said, we're not a Navy, we're a Coast Guard unit. And at first I knew the Coast Guard had been involved in the in base of me with Jima. But I'll never forget how good they treated us. So. When you were on Iwo Jima, can you talk to us about your experiences with Japanese snipers? Yeah, I was hit by a Japanese sniper. Uh, the Japanese snipers were real good. Uh, when we were first going into the line, we came under power from Japanese snipers. They didn't hit anybody, but they sure scared the hell out of us. And uh, the Japanese... Uh, the favorite sniper weapon was a 25, a seven, uh, 65 millimeter. And it was uh, about an equivalent to a 257 Roberts in power. And that was our favorite sniper weapon. And it was a fine one. 
The outsides of the rifle were real rough and not very mellow, but they had taken great pains on the rifling and interior workings of them, and they were really accurate rifles. They didn't have scope sights, but they were they had peep sights, and they were real accurate. And we were to sniper fire towards the last of the campaign. The biggest part of our people wounded were wounded by Japanese sniper fire. I mean, that must be awful, not knowing yeah. where the enemy is, but knowing that they have a bead on you. Yeah, that was a, that was a constant threat. We knew that whenever you're out and open, you were probably under observation of a Japanese sniper. Because they knew where you were. So when you got out and open, you kept moving. Can you talk to us about your experiences finding Japanese, you know, positions? Did you actually ever go into any of the caves? Oh, you... yes. Uh, we went into a lot of the caves. And uh, after the campaign was over, the Japanese holed up in a lot of those caves. And our Marines would go into the caves, wait until the middle of the day, and they'd go into the caves... And uh, there was real hot in those caves. Uh, like I say, the rock was real hot. And the Japanese would be stripped down and uh, laying on a blanket. And uh, the people would go to the flashlight and, and a uh, mud carving. And they would go in those caves and find the Japanese asleep. And they'd shoot into them and then throw a grenade and then back out of the cave while the grenade went off. And uh, they they had hospitals, water systems, uh, everything was underground. Could you tell us about some of the times you actually saw flamethrowers being used? Oh yeah, we we used them. We had uh, a flamethrower was the most dangerous job we had in the Marine Corps. The Japanese hated them, and they'd see a flamethrower operator coming, they would really concentrate the fire on him. And they'd get, we'd give them cover fire, and they'd get into the caves, where they'd get in the cave, and then they'd shoot them, reach around the corner and shoot a ball of flame in there. Usually they'd have two, one wait a few seconds, a second blast. And you'd hear the Japanese heads uh, uh, on fire. They, were, they used jelly gasoline and burned for a long time after the flame went out, and uh, we used a, uh, we had uh, a flamethrower man assigned to every squad, that was every 12 men, and they were from a special weapons company, and we we were constantly carrying uh, flamethrower fuel up to the beach to refuel the flamethrowers. I remember one uh, uh, night, it was late in the evening, we moved a flamethrower man into a cave. He was about 100 yards ahead of us. We moved him into the cave, and we were giving cover fire with every movement we saw we'd fire at, and every hole and everything we'd fire into. And the flamethrower man moved in, and his flamethrower misfired. And he went in, the, and his flamethrower misfired. He didn't fire, and... Uh, the Japanese caught him and drug him into the hole. They run out and grabbed him and drug him into the hole. What is anything we could do about it? And we heard him screaming all night. They were torturing him? Yeah, they were torturing him. That was another reason we wouldn't be taken prisoner by the Japanese. Most of our people felt the same way. If we were wounded and couldn't be withdrawn out of an area, well, we'd either take our own life or get one of our buddies to do it for us. I never had had to do it to any of my buddies, but I was prepared to if I had to. You know, you guys had a lot of air support from uh -huh. the Marine and the Navy yeah, we had, fires. We had a lot of air support on Evo. Can you, t can you describe what was it like to see these planes coming and knocking out positions? Uh They'd come right over you, right over your head, and they'd strafe and bomb ahead of you. Any holes they could see, any 
Oh, they called in for rival fire or uh, airplane fire, and they dropped uh, quite a bit of napalm in those cave areas. And uh, those, some of those ships were literally riddled and be holes every 10 feet apart through the cliffs where they have tunnels inside, they have fire ports coming out. They had a lot of that, and uh, the napalm was really effective against those. And what do you remember about the American tanks? Some of them had flamethrowers on oh, it as well. We had, uh, we had some little tanks. The Marine Corps had some little tanks. Uh, they were uh, mostly used for hauling supplies and things back and forth from the beach. And toward the last of the campaign, the, some of the tanks were equipped with blades, and they blade the road to the back, and they, we had some tanks backed us up. But they all was wounded. We had an American tank went down the ridge to our right about four or five hundred yards away, and he was supposed to give us covering fire in our advance. And I remember we were going out down that little ridge, I was right on the side of the cliff. The cliff was on the right, I was the closest man to the cliff. And all of a sudden we came under fire, it was from our own tank. Uh, he uh, thought we were Japanese soldiers. And uh, we got him caught down and then we went ahead and he didn't hit anybody. It makes you wonder how many people, you know, suffered from friendly fire. Oh, we had some, but there was no doubt. It would, uh, it would have been mostly at night that people wondered when they didn't have any star shells. The Japanese were what you call in your foxholes. When the star shells were out, they'd call in, and they'd call into your foxholes and drop a grenade, or maybe sometimes even jump in with a grenade in the hand, jump in the foxholes. And they all they always carried a knife or a bayonet when they did that. And we had a lot of people hurt, several people hurt by Japanese infiltrators. Do you remember any specific times that happened in your vicinity? Yeah, we had always uh, the night we were on uh, we were on point duty. I was, uh, we had moved up a uh, ways during the day and there was a little rocky knoll on our left, and we uh, were asked, it was our turn to be uh, observation post. And we crawled up on that little knoll, and we took our intention tools and dug out a little trench and pushed the dirt ahead of us. And we were up there, and we finally made it big enough, we crawled into the hole. And then we hit some sulfur rocks, and we were pried those rocks up, reach up and set them on top of the. And I remember one, we had the hole probably two feet high, and I, I found a big sulfur rock, and it was too big to lift up my hand, so I came up on my knees and lifted it up. I set it on that over that shoulder, and. The Japanese machine gunner opened up on me, and he hit a layer right below that rock and blew gravel and dirt in my face. And if I had to have that rock up, I would have been cut in too. And then that night, uh, we had a Japanese soldier crawled into our, our foxhole with us, trying to wipe out, wipe, wipe out our observation post, and we. Uh, have a little hole, we'd lay rocks up, have a little hole, we'd look all the way around our foxhole and watch for Japanese crawl in with the star shells and watch for Japanese bodies, uh, uh, figures, movement. My buddy and I killed them with a K-bar bar, with a K -bar knives. Or in trench knife. We couldn't get to a rifle or anything. I had no fear of dying. Not, not, I didn't want to die, but I had no particular fear of dying. But I had a fear of dying painfully. I listened to an, uh, another interview that you did with Paul, the, the, with the radio, Paul Loeffler. 
What's that? You know, that other man who came to interview you yeah. a couple weeks ago, I listened to that interview, and you mentioned a couple names to him uh, of men who you remember that were killed from your outfit. Uh, you told me earlier about Binder. Binder, Binder was from New York. He was kind of a dead-end kid from New York. And, uh, George Cager from, from uh, Mayfield, Colorado. Bob Bell was from Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Then we had the President of the South from New Iberia, Louisiana. And uh, a guy by the name of Berg James. They were close buddies of mine. Then we had a guy by the name of Bob Donahue who was killed on Iwo Jima. Uh, a guy by the name of Bess was killed on Iwo Jima. And uh, William Sherman from southern New Mexico was killed on Iwo Jima. And do you remember Sherman? Yeah, I remember Sherman. He was from Roswell area. And, and there were two other names, O'Hannon? Bohannon? Bohannon, I think, was from uh, Ohio or somewhere up there. And, and the last one was Christensen. Yeah, Christensen was, uh, he was a, from the Middle East someplace. He was a great, big, tall Swedish fella. And he got shot through the neck. And he was, when I went back to the hospital in Guam, he was in the bed next to me. He was totally paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, I remember he would, it was hot, and he would sweat on the wall, and I would reach over and wipe his forehead off. He was a real gentle giant, Christensen was. I really liked him. Did he, did he survive? I don't know. I didn't, haven't heard a word from him since I left service. But uh, Donahue... I got a letter from his mother. When I forgot on the service, she wanted to know if I knew anything about him. And I told her the truth that he got shot in the head. Didn't know what hit him. And uh, uh, he was killed. Uh, it wasn't in my foxhole. He was killed a short distance from where I was. And uh, then Best was killed. A short distance from me, and uh, Binder was right next to me, uh, right uh, arms length away from me. Yeah. I tell you, my time on Evo, of course, we all swore we wouldn't enlist again, but if I had to do over again, I'd do the same thing again, only I'd do it better. Knowing what I know now, I would have, I would have probably been a better brain. Because that time I didn't think, I just did what I was told. And uh, I was scared to death the whole time I was there. Anybody that had any brains was scared. Uh, but I overcame. The thing is, the difference between a coward and a brave man is that a coward is afraid constantly. The brave man is afraid, but still does what he needs to do in spite of it. Can you tell us about uh, coming back home, what your reunion with your family was like? Yeah, I uh, was waiting discharge, and my parents called me and asked if I wanted to sold this property that I have here now was up for sale. I wanted to know if I wanted it, and I wrote them back and told them I sure did. I'd seen all I wanted in the wide, cruel world at that time. And so they bought it for me, and I got, when I got out of service, I took out a GI loan and paid for it, and then I've had the place ever since as a retirement property. But I was sure glad to get home, and uh, actually it was a real tearjerker. I went, I went uh, 15 days after I got discharged, I went back to work for the Navy Fish Department. I worked for them for 32 years. Can you actually paint the picture, though, when you saw your mom and your stepdad for the first time? It was, uh, oh, they were sure glad to see me, and I was glad to see them. Believe me. And, uh, 
It wasn't a lot of tears over the thing, but we were really visited and hugged each other for hours. 